and the recording will begin. Okay, so welcome all to CSE 104 um, and um, the course, well, the way I want to call it is it's basically computational complexity. And so the way I want to begin this course is, you know, by walking you through what I think is probably one of the most fundamental theorems about computation and really where all of this starts. And uh, let me sort of state it informally, then I will state it formally. So the informal statement is no matter what your model of computation, no matter what your model of computation, there exist uncomputable functions. Okay? So, this is like a deeply profound, almost philosophical statement. It's even remarkable that you can even prove something about this. And, you know, again, I still remember the first time I saw the proof, it completely blew my mind. And uh, even if you've seen this proof once, I think it is totally worth seeing it again. And the more times you see it, the more you understand how profound it is. So what do we mean by model of computation? So, you know, because we know programming, a model of computation, we can just think of a C program, Python, assembly, you know, ordering people around and asking them to do tasks. And I, I'm not joking. I mean, you could basically think that my model of computation is I'm going to tell this person to go and do that, that person to go and do that. They will come to me with answers. And based on those answers, I will compute something. And the point is, regardless, regardless of the model, a program, a program is a finite string. Now it's a finite string in English or whatever language, but you know, for convenience, we will just say it's a finite string in binary because we could just encode everything into binary. So a program is just a finite string. Um, yes. Could I briefly uh, test my, um, test what I remember here? Yes, um, please. I think, um, or to my memory, the brief justification for why uh, there exist uncomputable functions is because um, there are countably many programs. Yes. Or countably infinite programs, but there's uncountably many functions that you can have. Exactly. So yeah, that, so that is exactly what I'm going to formalize here. And and the argument there is called diagonalization. The argument there is diagonalization, exactly. Okay. Uh, I'm going to present it in a slightly more general form. But it's, it's exactly that. That is correct. Okay. So regardless of the model, a program is a finite string. Now note that there are infinitely many programs. Right? And you can think of it in whatever model, whatever language, if, whatever language you have, you can come up with infinitely many programs. And there are infinitely many functions. And, you know, for simplicity, we'll just think of functions that go from natural numbers to true or false to 0, 1, right? Functions from natural numbers to 0, 1. So there are infinitely many functions where a function is just you know a mapping from n to 0 1 but now now this is important a function is represented is represented as an infinite string 
right? A function is an infinite string. A program is a finite string. Nonetheless, there are infinitely many programs and there are infinitely many functions. If there's any confusion at this point, you should stop me and ask me, is this clear? Functions are finite strings. I'm sorry, my apologies. Programs are finite strings. Functions are infinite strings. But there are infinitely many programs and there are infinitely many functions. Questions? Okay, so far so good. So let me now state a profound statement, a profound theorem by Cantor in 1891. And actually it was a theorem that, you know, as I will talk about it, you know, sort of shook the foundation of mathematics or with the question that it led to really shook the foundation of mathematics. But even this statement was pretty darn profound for its time. It was actually even had a hard time publishing it. And what he says is there are more infinite strings than finite strings. Meaning, you know, infinite strings is a function and finite strings programs. So what it says is there are more functions than there are programs. So obviously, there are some functions that cannot be computed. Because if you think about a program as computing a function, then there are just more functions than there are programs. Which if you think about it, you think, how can one argue such a thing? Because there are infinitely many programs. So how can one even argue that there are more program, there are more functions than programs? Because there are infinitely many programs. Questions. Does that make sense? I have a quick question. Yes. Um, why are functions represented as an infinite string? Is it because we just like every single map we just label them? Yes, right? exactly. You can just okay. you can just think of the map. Yeah, you, you you just think of it's a string where the ith element of the string or the ith character is simply you know f of i. Right. Okay, so, gotcha. so right. So maybe I should, I should have, I should have written this out. Sorry, I should have written this out. So I could write out f of one, f of two, f of three, f of four, so on and so forth. And this would give me an infinite string. Okay. So you can think of, I can take any function, like for example, I take the function of prime numbers, and I can represent that as an infinite string, infinite binary string. I can even take something like the natural number could itself represent a piece of code, right? The natural number could, it be, could be a piece of code and then my function maps valid pieces of code in C, you know, to one, to true. And so then this would be the function, or you can also call it the language of C programs, a valid C programs encoded as a natural number. Yes. So just so just an enumeration of the function. It's just an enumeration of the function. It's it's well okay. It's an enumeration. Yeah. It's it's like an explicit description of what's in the language and what's not in the language. If you think of this as a language. Okay. Thank you. Uh, question. Yes. So so the function which maps every program to an encoding is also itself infinite. Uh, so say that again, a, a function that maps... So, so you said a program can be uh, encoded, right? It can be represented as a number. I think that's what you said. As a natural number, yes. As a natural number. So it means there's a function from programs to natural numbers. Correct. So that encoding function, if we call it so, yes. is itself infinite, right? Or am I wrong? Is itself infinite? As in, if you represent it as an infinite string, yes, that would... I mean, in, in the, the, the problem is everything here is infinite. Now, the function that you described is kind of distinct from my functions. Right now, I'm just thinking of functions that map natural numbers to 0, 1. And the right. function okay. that you're talking about was mapping strings to natural numbers, which is, a, which is actually a more general case than this. 
Right. Okay. That's an okay. even more general function, but you'll see that actually that this is good enough. I mean, I, I don't. I, I, that, that's. I think a digression. I'm just saying that you can think of a. F you can think of a piece of code as a natural number, right? Just think of code as yeah, a binary yeah. string, and then the binary you encode it as. Oh, okay. So solid. the actual encode. Okay, never Yeah, okay. yeah. So, but, but, but that. Yeah, I'm not saying anything. You know, there's nothing particularly profound in that, right? That's just standard binary encoding. It's just that instead of. Okay, I could. I could do this. I could also do this. And I claim these are one and the same. I mean, in effect, in terms of expressive power, these are identical. Because any finite string can be represented as a natural number. Any natural number can be represented as a finite Boolean string. Right? So I could either look at this or this and they're both the same sometimes it's convenient to do the latter when I want to think of it as a string it's convenient because then this gives me the indexing sometimes I might want to use this representation but they're all identical they're identical in terms of expressive power meaning that any function of this form can be expressed as a function of that form clear thanks yes question yes uh, can you hear me yes um, this is a really dumb question but what is this? I forgot the syntax of what a star means. Oh, star, yes. So, um, star basically, okay, star literally just means finite strings in Boolean. But formally speaking, you can think of 0, 1 star, which is the clean closure, is the union of all natural numbers of 0, 1 to the k. Does that make sense? So all finite strings, right? So I take the union over all, for all k. So this is the set of k bit, k bit strings. I'm looking at all possible bit strings, finite bit strings. Awesome. This is, okay, but, and again, it's not a dumb question because there's a very important point here that I want to make sure that you understand. This is finite strings. This is an infinite string. But there are infinitely many finite strings and there are infinitely many infinite strings. So give it a second to sink in. There are infinitely many finite strings. There are infinitely many infinite strings. So it is not at all obvious that there are more infinite strings than finite strings. And, you know, j just to sort of, just to hammer down, hammer out, and sort of impress upon you the deepness of this theorem, let me tell, let me show you a simple example, okay? Let E be the set of even natural numbers. I'll just use even natural numbers. So clearly, this is a strict subset of natural numbers, right? Question Are there more natural numbers? Then even numbers? Are there more natural numbers than even numbers? I think the definitions of cardinality, I suppose not. Exactly. So you have to bring in the definition of cardinality, right? Even though that you have the number of even the set of even numbers is a strict subset by cardinality definitions they're actually the same and this is just to tell you why thinking about inf infinities can be quite tricky
right? Because there is clearly, the problem is, the answer would be, no, there is a bijection from the even numbers to the natural numbers, right? There is a bijection from the even numbers to the natural numbers, and that bijection is obtained just by dividing by 2, right? So you take every even number, you divide it by 2, and this gives you a bijection between a smaller set and a larger set. So that's absurd. So actually, you need to say these sets have the same size because there's a bijection between them, even though E is a strict subset of N. Questions? Do you think you can repeat that just once more? Sure. Um, what I was trying to do was to, let me just get the windows up. Okay, so the set of even numbers is a strict subset of the set of natural numbers, right? Clearly, so what is, what is this? This is the set two, four, six, eight, so on and so forth. And what is this set? It says one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. Clearly, E is a strict subset of N. On the other hand, let me define a bijection. Let me define this function from even numbers to natural numbers, where phi of X is the X divided by two. Phi is a bijection. So I actually have a bijection from a subset to a superset, which cannot happen when you take finite things. I mean, a bijection, how can you have a bijection from something that is smaller to something that is larger? And therefore, weirdly enough, you logically conclude that actually the size of E and the size of N are actually the same, even though one is a subset of the, a strict subset of the other. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Any further questions? Okay, so now let me state Cantor's theorem, and I will state it somewhat more generally. I'm going to state a more general theorem, and then we'll go ahead and we'll see, uh, we'll apply it in this, in this context. So I'm gonna, my theorem is consider any set X, maybe infinite right so there's any set x and if it really like bothers you as to what the set is you know you could think of strings you can think of whatever you want but just think of you know you have a notion of a set so consider any set and there cannot exist a bijection from x to 2 to the x, and this is the power set of x. So what this says is that for any set, if you take the power set, you will actually always have more things, that you cannot have a bijection from the power set, from, from x to the power set. Okay? So now let me let me give the proof, and the proof is really Cantor's diagonalization. The proof is diagonalization. So let me write out this proof, and then I will, I will show you, you know, how it works for um, for the setting that we just talked about. Okay, so we'll do a proof by contradiction. 
we'll say suppose there exists a bijection phi from x to the power set okay now every uh, set in 2 to the x can be represented represented as an incidence vector incidence vector and an incidence vector is simply so I'll just say that every set s can be represented by a function which maps x to 0 1 okay is this is this clear so, that every set every set can be represented basically as a function okay so let me be sorry every set in the power set of x so this is a collection of x and i can think of it as basically just a vector it's simply just saying that what I could have is think of, you know, for every, let me think of this as x. How do you get, how do you get a set? How do you get a subset of x? Well, you can say, okay, so this is zero. I'm going to map this to one, so on and so forth. I'm going to map this to zero and so on and so forth. Right? So is, is that clear? That every set can be represented as an incidence vector, right? So basically what I do is I just take every element in X and I say, okay, that's in the set or not in the set. So that's a map to zero, one. Okay? So far so good, any questions about that? Okay, good. So I have, indeed, for the first time in my teaching career, I actually have two pens and I've run out of ink in both of them. So I'm going to have to refill. I'm going to pause the recording for now. Recording, okay. Incidence vector simply means this. I'm just saying every set can be represented as a function. So if, if incidence, maybe I should say, I'll call it the incidence function. Hopefully that's better. It's a function, right? Every set in the power set, set is being overloaded here, but every set that's an element of two to the x can be represented as a function from x to binary, just saying that who's in the set and who's not in the set, right? So f s of x is equal to one or zero if x is in the set or x is not in the set. So I'm just saying that I can treat any set in the power set as a Boolean function from X, you know, to, to Boolean. Okay, is that clear? Questions? Okay. So now we said there is a bijection phi from x to the power set can be interpreted as, I mean, this is a bijection, right? A bijection. There is a bijection phi from x to the set of all functions, all binary functions on x. So this is saying phi is a bijection phi is a bijection from x to binary or boolean functions over x okay is that is that clear Okay, now I'm going to perform diagonalization. Now I'm going to do diagonalization. Diagonalization. 
So the process of diagonalization. Diagonalization is now I'm going to define g. So g is going to be a function from x to 0, 1. So g is a set in 2 to the x, right? In, yes. Okay? So I will just do g of x is going to be defined. Now, this is the clever bit, right? Now, you know, sort of watch this carefully. The negation, right? It's going to be a bit. It's going to negate. g of x is going to be the negation of phi of x applied to x. Parse this expression first. What is this saying? So to find out what g of x is, you apply your bijection on the element. This is a function from x to 0, 1. So apply that function on x, little x, and this is going to give you 0 or 1. Take the negation of that. And this is now some function. So in essence, this is saying phi of x is basically the set that x is supposed to map to under the supposed bijection we have. And then we're testing if x is in that set. And then we're switching the result. Yeah. We're switching the result, right? right? And so now what we're saying is that there exists no y in x such that phi of y is actually going to be the function g. Right? Now say y. Suppose not. Suppose not. So, phi of y was equal to g, right? And so, therefore, what this means is phi of y as a function evaluated on y must be equal to g of y. But then g of y was defined to be the negation of phi of y applied to y. Contradiction here. Right? And therefore, there exists no y such that phi of y is equal to g. That means phi is not a bijection. And that ends the proof. Okay, so I just took you through one of the most profound arguments in mathematics, and obviously it's going to take some time to sink in. So let's stop and let's discuss this proof. Right? This is not, this is a short but rather profound proof. So let's walk through this again. Okay, where am I starting? I'm saying take any set x, which is potentially infinite. There cannot exist a bijection from the set to the power set. Now, I'm going to prove this using diagonalization. This is Cantor's proof. Okay. Proof by contradiction. Suppose there existed a bijection. So there's a bijection phi from x to the power set of x. I am going to interpret <coughs> the power set of x as Boolean functions from x to 0, 1. And I can do this because I can say every set in the power set can be thought of as I'm taking all the elements of x and I'm deciding which ones to keep and which ones to throw away. So I could treat any set s as a function which simply maps the elements in the set to 1 and those that are not in the set to 0. Okay. This is the bijection. Now the bijection can be interpreted as phi is a map from x to functions of x, x 
from x to binary functions over x. Now I do, now I'm going to do diagonalization. Diagonalization says, well, okay, so now I'm going to define a function g from x to 0, 1, which is not going to be the map of, you know, is not going to be in the range of phi. And that, that's going to be my contradiction. And so the diagonalization step is going to say, well, let's take g, let's define g of x as follows. g of x is going to be the Boolean negation, the bit negation of phi of x applied on x. All right, so for any x, I can apply phi, I get a function, and I apply that function on x. Okay? Now I claim that there exists no y in capital X such that phi of y is equal to g. But then that would say that phi is not a bijection, contradicting my original statement that phi was a bijection. Okay, why can there not exist any such y? Well, suppose not. Suppose there was some y such so that phi of y is equal to g. Well, we know that because these functions are equal, they're the same function, they have to evaluate the same on every possible input. And so let me just feed the input y to them. But then I get a contradiction because g was actually defined by negating phi of y on y. And therefore, there cannot exist a bijection from x to 2 to the x. So I'm going to pause at this point. Questions? Um, I have a question. So is y... Okay. So why do we call this diagonalization, you know, sort of a direct corollary a direct corollary is there is no bijection from natural numbers to two to the natural numbers. Right? This is this was the standard statement, and the way you prove that typically you'll see is that the process of of diagonalization would say that. Um, Suppose there is, suppose there is a bijection, right? And then so you would say that there is a bijection phi from uh, natural numbers to two to the natural numbers. But this I can interpret as an infinite string in 0, 1, right? Because I can say that, you know, for any, um, let me, let me, let me say any f in 2 to the n. Because I can think of f as now a function. I can think of the, you know, any element as a function. I can just write this as f of 1, f of 2, f of 3, so on and so forth. So I can interpret this as an infinite string, right? And then diagonalization would say, well, okay, so now you construct this table, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to put functions here, and we're going to put inputs here. So what I'll say is the function I'm going to have is phi of 1, phi of 2, phi of 3, so on and so forth. So I'm just going to sort of write these down here, right? And I can write phi of 1 as this, right? So So here is 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth. So I have a function, and so all of these are going to be 0, 1, 1, 0, whatever. This is something Boolean. And diagonalization says you take the diagonal. So what is the diagonal? This element here is essentially phi of i of evaluated at i. And if I negate this, then what I get is an element that cannot be any of the rows and this is the process of diagonalization so this is why it's called diagonalization okay so is that is that clear and so with this corollary we also have sort of i guess a corollary of the corollary is there is no bijection from 
because we can treat this as n. We can just encode it as natural numbers. So there is no bijection from finite strings to functions going to 0, 1. This is the same thing as this, and this is the same thing. So this is all equivalent to this, equivalent to infinite strings. Okay? Questions? Questions? Okay. So what this says is, remarkably, what this says is that infinities can be compared, which is really deep. So now I'm going to define something. A left knot, this is called a left knot. Not that knot, but this knot, a left knot. A left knot is the cardinality of natural numbers. It's just a symbol that says this is the infinity. Right? And a left one is the cardinality of the power set, which, if you think a little bit about it, and this is not obvious, you can think of infinite Boolean strings, which you can also think of as real numbers. Now this we can discuss a little later, but right now think of this as this is the cardinality of the power set. And the theorem of Cantor basically says that a left knot is not equal to a left one. Right? It says the cardinality of the natural numbers is in some sense strictly smaller than the cardinality of um of the power set of natural numbers, or we can say that, you know, a left knot is strictly less than a left one, right? So a left knot is strictly smaller than a left one. So David Hilbert in his famous address in 1900 where he posed a bunch of problems, this is called Hilbert's first problem, and this is called the continuum, continuum, hypothesis. So the question is, is there a cardinality in between? And for those of you with the terms countable and uncountable, this is countably infinite and this is uncountably infinite. And the question is, is there a cardinality in between? This is also referred to as Hilbert's first problem. The answer turned out to be something in quotes. It's actually, it's not even ob like, it's a very surprising statement. Basically, the answer shook, it basically shook mathematics, or I should say shook the foundations of mathematics. It completely changed things because what happened was Gödel proved in 1940, the continuum, however, is called CH. He said CH cannot be disproved. It cannot be disproved, you know, under standard set theory. I mean, this is called zermelo frankel set theory, which I don't want to get into what, what that is. So Gödel showed that it cannot be disproved. You actually cannot disprove the continuum hypothesis. And what Cohen showed 
in 63 is this cannot be proved again under Sir Mello Franco set theory and so this is often said that the continuum hypothesis is independent is independent of the axioms of set theory so it was the resolution, I mean, if one can call it a resolution, was, it, it is a resolution, I guess, was completely crazy. It said that it, the statement is neither true nor false, nor can you f prove one way or the other. So, so it says that this statement, which is a very well-defined statement, like if you look at, you know, you look at the statement, you look at our proofs, everything is well-defined, but you actually can neither prove the statement nor disprove the statement under standard set theory and therefore it is called independent of the axioms of set theory now obviously you know in this course we're not going to go deeper into the continuum hypothesis in any of the statements but i think it's a natural question that comes up that when you think about infinities and why do you think about infinities well you're thinking about computation and you want to argue about whether there exist uncomputable functions and you say there can there must exist uncomputable function there exists uncomputable functions because of this theorem and then the current continuum hypothesis is a natural sort of question and this is a shocking answer so let me pause here i will take any questions and then you know we can talk further then i will talk further go back to the recording okay so you know with that digression about the continuum hypothesis, let's now sort of dig into what is it that we're going to be doing in this course. So here's one way of looking at it. This, you can think of the universe of all functions. And I guess, you know, for now, functions are just going to be these things. And you know, what, what you have is a really small set, which are all computable functions. So in computability theory, you're trying to sort of understand the relationship between these, and you try to understand the boundary of computability to uncomputability. That is called computability theory. But in complexity theory, you kind of drive down into this and you're trying to understand within computable functions. You have another smaller set called efficiently. I'll put this in quotes because we have to define what efficiently means. Efficiently computable functions. And this interface here between what is efficiently computable and not efficiently computable, that interface there is what's called computational complexity theory. And this is going to be sort of the focus of the course. So the point of the previous proof was just to tell you that here is this big world here. Here's like the huge universe. Within that, there's a much smaller set of computable functions. Within that, we're going to actually drive down and look at what is efficiently computable, try to define that, and then understanding that is computational complexity theory. Now, towards this, what we need is we need a model of computation, a model of computation. And the model of computation that we're going to use are Turing machines. And why? Because I'll say TMs are, okay, so I'm going to sort of make a statement believed to be a universal model of computation. And this is also known as the Church Turing thesis. 
Now, what does this mean? It means that if a function can be computed, then there exists a Turing machine M, it's a function F, that computes F. This is not a mathematical theorem. This is a thesis. It's sort of like, think of it as a, it's a hypothesis, it's an assumption. It's almost like a physical assumption because you can ask, what, is you, what do you mean by can it be computed? And you would say, well, computed by a physically realizable machine. And, you know, hopefully you've probably seen some, of, some discussion of the Church Turing thesis in 103. So I don't want to get into too much detail about it. But essentially what I'm going to say is that all models of computation including quantum computers, including quantum computers, thus far discovered can be simulated by Turing machines. Okay, all models of computation that have been discovered thus far can be simulated by Turing machines. Now just to recall what a Turing machine does or how it works, what you have is a state machine a finite state machine. You have something called a tape, which is read, write. And then there's this thing called the head. And so the head is a finite state. The head sort of is like connecting the finite state machine to the tape. It's reading what's on the tape. And so in the tape, what you have is one way to, Q is usually a set of states. And, you know, sigma is an alphabet. You know, and for our purposes, we'll usually just use binary. Uh, and typically there is a special symbol called the space symbol. Depending on your notation, you might put space as part of the alphabet or not. You know, typically you, you think of it as separate. So there is a blank, or a, I'll call it the blank symbol. And you have a start state. You have a start state. And you have, you know, some Q accept, Q reject, which are final states. But what is most important, and so the, what is most important is the transition function, the transition function, which is basically a function that goes from uh, the states to the tape symbols. So we do um, this union blank to what it then gives you is essentially gives you three things. It gives you a state, it gives you symbol and a direction which is typically either going right or left. So another way to think of this is a transition function takes a state, it's going to take some symbol sigma and it's going to say transition to state Q prime right symbol sigma prime and move left or right. So hopefully you've seen these in the past and uh, I would recommend that you know if, if, um, if you want to brush up you may want to go and brush up on the basic uh, definition of the Turing machine and you know we can easily adapt the Turing machine, the initialization, initialize is usually the, uh, the input is written on the tape and blanks elsewhere. 
right? So you think of the tape as basically having the input and a bunch of blanks. And then, you know, it terminates when it hits one of the, the, halting, the halting states. OK? So this is a quick summary of Turing machines. And, you know, one thing that is <coughs> important to note is that, you know, Turing machines are very robust. What this means is if you modify a Turing machine, then often, and you do something that seemingly gives it more power, you can always come up with a simpler Turing machine that has the same power. So the basic Turing machine, a basic Turing machine has a single tape. Single tape and one head. Right? But you can also have what's called a a multi-headed Turing machine. Okay, so a multi-headed Turing machine has K tapes and K heads. Right? So now you could think of it as here's a Turing machine. It's got a bunch of tapes here. And then you have this, this, and that. Like you have multiple heads. Right? And so you may have seen this in like 103. You can actually simulate a multi headed Turing machine with a basic Turing machine. Okay? And I'll just sort of really quickly run over this uh, the simulation so that you can you can see it um, and so what you do is let's just say there are k tapes so you can merge the k tapes into one tape right well how do you merge it well you say okay so if you think of this as tape one tape two and tape three you simply interleave the tapes Right, this is saying that tape one and tape two and tape three are kind of smooshed together into one tape just by sort of lining up the cells. You could say, I'm going to take one cell in one, one cell in two, one cell in three, and I'm going to merge it together. So this is interleaving the tapes. Interleaving the tapes. Okay, but now I have to keep track of K heads. I have to keep track of K heads but the basic Turing machine only has one head. Does anyone recall how, how to do that? Okay, so recall how does that work? Well, we're going to change our alphabet now. We're going to change the alphabet now. So we're going to change the alphabet and so we're going to create this new alphabet that I call sigma hat and so sigma hat is going to have sigma union. Now it's going to have these new symbols. It's going to have these new symbols. So for every sigma in this, I'm going to say sigma hat 1, sigma hat 2, sigma hat 3, up to sigma hat k. Okay, I'm going to have this sort of for all sigma. So this is like marking the head. So sigma hat i means the ith head is at this position on the tape. So what this means is if I have my if I have my tape over here and if I have some sigma hat one, sigma hat two here, sigma maybe no, I'll say you know sigma prime and then I'll have some other sigma alpha hat 3, I have beta hat 4. That means if this is the tape, what this means is that the first head is here, the second head is there, the third head is there, 
and the fourth head is there. So there could just be one head, and the head is just going to scan back and forth to figure out where all the other k heads are, and then transition accordingly. Okay, does this make sense? So I went through this kind of quickly. I'm going to revisit it again, but hopefully, you know, you would recall the basic idea. Questions? Do you see how the simulation can be done? And so just one thing that I want one thing that I wanted to add here is also like a Turing machine with a two-dimensional tape. So suppose its tape was actually a plane. Well you can convert this convert this to a one-dimensional tape by just breaking up you know the tape into these segments. Right? You can break it up into these segments. And you can kind of line it up over here. Right, so you can break up, you can convert a 2D tape to a 1D tape. And then, you know, you can sort of, given a position on the tape, convert position into the 2D tape and simulate. Right? I'm not, you know, it, it's sort of, it's a lot of work to go through all the details of how one would do the conversion, and it's mostly just sort of menial details. It's just a lot of work. But the point is that you can essentially convert any position in one dimension to one and two dimensional just by breaking up the two dimensional tape into a lot of one dimensional segments. You stitch them together to get a one-dimensional tape. And then you just have to, you have a correspondence between every position here and here. And your Turing machine could go ahead and compute those correspondences and go ahead and transition accordingly based on this. I remember that um, when I took the uh, CS130 class that this was actually one of the homework problems. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, an example of one way that you can number the 2D plane or uh, 2D, I guess, integer lattice mm -hmm. to this 1D thing is like a, the Ulam spiral, for example. Yeah, you could do an Ulam spiral, or you could even just, you know, a simpler thing is just to break it up into squares, for example. This would be a, like an even simpler thing to do. But yes, you could you could do an Ulam spiral, you could break it up into squares, you could take any map that maps 2D to 1D, you know, uniquely, a bijection between the plane and the line. Mm -hmm. Right? And you can essentially do this entire conversion. The reason why I sort of say this is just to tell you that Turing machines with a single tape can essentially simulate more fancier models where you have Turing machines with multiple tapes, Turing machines with a two-dimensional tape, or even a three-dimensional tape. And so all of these things can be done. They can be simulated. Now, um, let me sort of end by asking you a couple of questions. So the first question first question is consider a Turing machine with a k bit register on transition the Turing machine overwrites the register with a new value, right? And the TM's transition function depends on the register content. Okay, does this make sense? So you have a Turing machine that now has a k-bit register. And the question is, 
can such a Turing machine be simulated by a standard Turing machine? Can we answer this right now? Or as in a, can yeah, I? Yeah, just, I mean, or, I don't know. So how many of you know the answer? Maybe you should just clap and thumbs, you know, just so that I, I get some sense of whether you've seen this question, you know the answer. Let me pause and, you know, so think about it. So before you leave, you know, given that this is a small class and given that I have a lot of flexibility in teaching it the way I want, I guess one of the things that I'd like is some feedback of, is the speed okay at which I'm going? Like, do you understand what I'm doing? I think I fall back a little bit sometimes. I'm sorry? I think I fall behind a little bit sometimes. Okay. So just a little bit slower in certain moments. Mm -hmm. I think you did a great job with uh, setting space for questions, though, so I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I think I would agree. Like, as long as you leave space for questions, I think, uh, I think uh, I'd be fine. Okay. Um... Yeah, so I will, you know, um, I guess, do you want me to cover more background? What do you mean by background? What I mean by background is I assume that you're familiar, okay, so my assumption is that you know 103 and now you're taking the scores. But of course, I also know that, you know, students forget things. So, for example, okay, let me ask you. Do you want me to prove the undecidability of the halting problem? And you know, just say yes or no, like, you know, or thumbs up. Thumbs up if you want me to prove, if you want to see the proof of the undecidability of the halting problem. Uh, so how, with how much detail do you expect us to know the truth? Like, I, so for example, like high level, you can say that, okay, you have a Turing machine. And like, if you really want to prove it, you can prove it in three, four lines, right? Is that knowing that much enough? Yeah, knowing that much is enough, right? Because if you, my position is if you know the, if you have the three, four line idea and you need to sit down and write a formal proof, you can do it. Yes. You know, maybe you won't be able to do it in 10 minutes, but you know, you'll think about it for a bit, you'll write it down, maybe you'll make some error, but as long as you have the basic idea, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, and the basic idea is using the universal Turing machine, you know, right. and, and doing diagonalization. So. If, if what I said made sense to you, then I think you know the proof. I guess the question is like, you know, should I, do you want me to actually, should I do it formally? Like, you know, the undecidability of the halting problem. And, you know, some of you said, some of you said yes. I mean, the thing is, the more feedback you give me, either positive or negative, the more useful it will be, because otherwise I might just plow through, like, you know, the first seven chapters of Aurora Barak without sort of, you know, without sort of thinking about thinking about things um, too clearly. I would recommend that, you know, if it's it's not a bad idea to go back and if you have notes on Turing machines, to go back and look at those notes. Just so that, you know, you sort of bring back a lot of those definitions. A lot of the constructions of this form are basically, you know, buried in, in the questions that you have over there. Um, because, you know, my aim is sort of, you know, I want to sort of discuss more about P versus NP, NP completeness, space completeness, and those concepts. So a lot of that sort of, you know, it's, um, it assumes some familiarity with this. It's not like you need to know all, you know, you need to remember everything in and out, but, but just that. Um, there's like a, there's a lot of stuff in the chat, which, wait, um, Um, oh yeah, so the, the, as the, the, I guess the fact for the video being a little laggy, it's because of the way I set things up, my recording actually will not be laggy. So my recording will be pretty crisp, but I hope the lag isn't that bad. I found that in the end, it is unfortunately the only solution that I have where I can write on paper and you can see it. So I don't know, is it, is it, is it you know, doable or?